So welcome everybody for the Women's Wellness um, Lunch Series. I'm excited to talk to you about your gynecology. This is the first uh, lecture in the series. Um, and so we're you know, excited to have you here and to join us to learn a little bit about your gynecology, which is what I do. Um, so I'm excited to share with you. So just an introduction about myself. I am a urogynecologist. My name is Nina Batia. I'm a um, physician that is board certified in both OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology, as well as urogynecology. My practice consists of urogynecology only. So I don't do any general gynecology, meaning annual exams, breast exams, pap smears, and that sort of thing. My specialty is strictly urogynecology. So I um, trained first as an OBGYN um, for four years of residency, and then I did a three-year fellowship in urogynecology. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and, and um, what types of patients and conditions that I treat. Um, I do have an office in Oldbridge. Uh, we do have a satellite location in Shrewsbury as well. I um, am affiliated with several Hackensack Meridian hospitals, including Bayshore, Riverview, and um, Oldbridge uh, Medical Center. Um, my specialty includes vaginal surgery and robotic um, surgery for conditions like prolapse and urinary incontinence. So today, these are our objectives for the talk today. We are going to learn about what urogynecology is. We're going to learn about um, some common urogynecology conditions, which include prolapse, overactive bladder, stress urinary incontinence. We'll talk about signs and symptoms um, that should prompt you to see a specialist like myself or, or any urogynecologist. And then we'll also talk about treatment options, which include surgical options as well as non-surgical options. So we'll start first with what is urogynecology. So we are a subspecialty of OBGYN or urology, and we provide comprehensive care for women with pelvic floor conditions. So a urogynecologist may have been a urologist or an OBGYN before subspecializing into urogynecology. Um, the conditions we treat include uh, pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. When you're looking for a urogynecologist, you might find some other type of wording, such as female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, urogynecology, sometimes even female urology. In general, you want to look for board certified physicians who are specializing in these conditions. So what is the pelvic floor? So the pelvic floor is what we are helping our patients with. The pelvic floor consists of muscles, ligaments, and connective tissue that are supporting some vital organs in your body. The organs that are being supported by your pelvic floor are your bladder, the uterus, the rectum, and the vagina itself. So this image just shows you where those organs are and how close in proximity they are. So your vagina supports the uterus, the bladder, and the rectum. So we'll learn as we go through these slides, when the vagina starts to fall or loses its support, organs such as the bladder, the um, rectum, and even the uterus can actually start to fall down as well. So our pelvic floor is very important uh, for women and it, and it really gives us a lot of our support. But unfortunately, over time and with age, the pelvic floor can actually weaken and lead to other significant problems. So um, we wanna know, or what you think, what, what is the likelihood of, or, or what's your chance of getting a pelvic floor disorder? So for women, the likelihood of getting a pelvic disorder is probably more common than you think. Um, is it one in three women that get this, one in eight or one in 15? So normally if I were to present this in front of a live audience, we would poll to, to see what um, the thought would be in the audience. But since this is virtual, you'll just have to kind of come up with an answer yourself and I'll, and I'll give you the answer. The answer is one in three. So it's more common than you think. One out of three women will develop a pelvic floor disorder. So between yourself, your mother, your daughter, one of you will have one of these conditions. Or amongst your friends, if you're sitting with two friends, one out of the, out of the three of you will probably develop a pelvic floor um, disorder. It's very common, and unfortunately, we don't really talk about it that much, but hopefully with webinars like this and just kind of getting the awareness out, um, women should, should know that these are really common conditions and they're very treatable. So we just want to make you aware that it is quite common um, that you may experience a pelvic floor disorder in your lifetime. So what are the pelvic floor disorders? Urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, urinary urgency, frequency, and nocturia. We're gonna talk about each of those, what they mean, um, and how do we address them. 
So urinary incontinence is just leakage of urine. So it, it, it can range from small drips or small drops of urine leaking. It can be your entire bladder that's letting out or anything in between. But any unwanted loss of urine, whether that's if you cough and sneeze and a little bit of urine leaks out, if you have that feeling that you need to go to the bathroom and you just can't make it in time and you, and you just start to lose urine, that's incontinence. So whether it's a little bit or a lot, it's all urinary incontinence, which is just leakage of urine. What are some of the symptoms of this? So again, any leaking with things like coughing, sneezing, running, jumping, exercising, lifting. I've had patients tell me when they um, are at the gym and they're exercising, that's when they leak. When they're lifting their children, they might leak. When they're bending down to you know, empty out the dishwasher, they might leak. So that, those are all forms of something called stress incontinence. Um, sometimes it's more of a frequency urgency issue where you get a very strong urge to go to the bathroom and it's not an urge that you can defer. So when you have to go, you have to go. You get that urge and, it, and, it, and you instantly just really, really have to run to get to the bathroom. And if that happens to you quite often, that's called frequency. Um, for some women, they can make it to the bathroom in time. For some women, they cannot. Um, you know, so if you're getting that urge to go and you can't make it to the bathroom in time, that would be called urge incontinence. Waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, some women can make it and some women cannot. So if you cannot make it to the bathroom at night, that would be another form of urge incontinence. Um, and for some women, unfortunately, they wake up already wet. So they wake up because they've noticed that they've, um, that they've lost urine. Um, for some women, urinary incontinence occurs with sexual activity. So that could be another form of incontinence. So if you suffer from urinary incontinence, just know that you're not alone. Um, it again is quite common. So for urinary incontinence itself, how many women over the age of 18 will actually suffer with urinary incontinence? And again, it's that this is one in four. So these conditions, whether it's a pelvic floor condition or just urinary incontinence, it's quite common. Unfortunately, as we get older, our incontinence or risk of incontinence actually increases. So incontinence will increase with age. Um, as you get older, you may find more urgency, more frequency, more need to go to the bathroom. Um, urgency can present itself in so many different forms. It can be you're at the sink washing dishes, that running water is what triggers you to get that urge to go. You're out shopping or you know out with friends, but as soon as you pull up to your driveway or put your keys in the door, all of a sudden you really have to go to the bathroom. That's an urgency. And eventually that may lead to urge incontinence where you can't get to the bathroom in time. And all of this increases with age. So over your lifetime, approximately 50% of women will experience some form of urinary incontinence. But the good news, it's very treatable and, and you know, your gynecologist like myself um, and others in the area are all here to help treat this for you. <clears throat> what can cause urinary incontinence? Uh, pelvic floor conditions like weakness of the muscles, urinary tract infections, drinking lots of caffeine, lots of coffee, um, alcohol, certain diuretic medications can all make it worse. If you suffer from constipation, this can be problematic. Some women have neuromuscular problems, such as if you've had a stroke, that can increase your chance of urinary incontinence. Um, MS can increase the risk. Whether you have anatomical problems, such as prolapse or kidney stones, can be um, a risk factor as well. How is it diagnosed? See your doctor. So whether that's your primary care, your OBGYN, your urologist, or your urogynecologist, you definitely want to be evaluated. With a simple medical history and physical exam, we can diagnose you with lots of these um, conditions. So there's no special testing that would need to be um, done to confirm that, that you have these problems. It's really based on your medica medical and um, medical history and your physical exam. <clears throat> when should you see a urogynecologist? You should see a urogynecologist if you're bothered by these conditions. Some women, unfortunately, wait a really long time before they see a specialist. Um, if you're wearing pads for urine leakage, um, if you feel like it's interfering with your lifestyle, your day-to-day -day activities, if you feel like you have to map or search for bathrooms, uh, or if you're planning out like your commute based on where bathrooms are, if you're restricting your fluids. So let's say you don't drink as much water because you're afraid that you're gonna have to keep going to the bathroom. Um, if it's affecting your, your sexual life or your intimacy with your partner, 
if incontinence is preventing you from doing things you love, exercising, socializing with your friends, going out and doing things. So if you're bothered by this, there's help available to you. And whether you start that conversation with your primary care doctor or your OBGYN, or if you call us directly and make an appointment just to be seen to talk about your problems um, that you're suffering with, there's treatments available for you. The types of urinary incontinence we touched on a little bit, but stress incontinence and urge incontinence. So those are the two most common types. Now there are others, but those are the most common. So again, stress incontinence is when you leak with cough, sneeze, laugh, run, jump, lifting, things like that. Urge incontinence is when you leak when you get the urge to go or that feeling that you have to go and you just can't make it in time. Within the umbrella of something called overactive bladder, there's urge incontinence, urgency, which is that strong urge to go and you can't defer it. Frequency when you go quite often or nocturia is when you wake up at night. Now, some women have both. Some women have both stress and urge incontinence, and that would be called mixed incontinence. For some women, they can't tell. They can't tell what's causing them to leak. They just know that they're wet, or that the urine's just coming out without any sort of warning or any kind of control. So those are all things that we can help you with. What are the treatment options? So there's lots of treatment options, whether it's conservative therapies like exercises, um, physical therapy, there are medications, there are surgeries, there's office-based procedures. Um, there's, there's plenty of things to help treat these problems. Um, and often we'll use a combination of therapies. So there may not be one solution um, for everybody. There's a combination of different things that we'll use. Um, it might be a combination of physical therapy and medications or a procedure. Um, it really depends on you specifically and what your symptoms are and what your goals for treatment are. But the good news is that a lot of this is curable. You don't have to live with incontinence. You don't have to wear pads. While it's common and it's, and it's something that you may hear is something that women have to deal with or that they do deal with, the, the truth is you don't have to live with it. You can treat it. Um, and there's pretty simple ways to, to address it. Um, so some of the non-surgical treatments, what can you do? Just simple lifestyle changes, whether that's um, decreasing the number of cups of coffee a day that you drink, or um, if, you, if you're someone who, let's say, drinks wine in the evening, but you get up a lot at night, you might want to cut that down because that may make a difference for you. There um, is some simple bladder retraining exercises that we can do where we have you keep a log of how often you go to the bathroom and we, and we look. And let's say you're going to the bathroom every hour we're going to try to push you by about 15 minutes to see, can you get yourself to, let's say, an hour and 15 minutes? Little by little, by making those changes, we can get you into a more normal range so you're not going as frequently. Physical therapy is very helpful. You can work with a therapist to strengthen your pelvic muscles. And these are specialized therapists that work on the pelvic floor only. So it may not be the same therapist that does shoulders and elbows, knees. It's a specific pelvic floor therapist to help you train those pelvic floor muscles. Um, there's other types of therapies that a physical therapist may do for you, including something called biofeedback, where we work on the nerves and the muscles of the bladder. And there's also support devices. So if you suffer from something called prolapse, which, which we'll talk about soon, prolapse is something that can be supported without surgery by using something called a pessary. There are medications that help with urinary control. So if you're having trouble where when you have to go, you have to go, and you have that strong urge to go, or you're going frequently, going to the bathroom all the time, not making it in time, waking up at night, that condition is called overactive bladder. And there's some really good medications out there to help treat that. Now there are older medications and newer medications and they all have different um, side effects, which we talk, we'll talk to you specifically about. Uh, we'll look at the list of medications you're on to see if there's any interaction, but there are some really good medication options out there for this, uh, for this condition. Um, the medications work by blocking some of the extra bladder spasms. So when you have overactivity of the bladder, the muscles are overactive. They contract and they're in spasm too much. And by taking the medications, you can decrease those muscle spasms. By doing that, it allows you more time to get to the bathroom, less of that strong urge. You'll still get the urge and you'll still know that you have to go, but you won't have to go, you won't have to drop everything and run to the bathroom. It's a more controllable situation. Hopefully you'll get up less at night and just not have to go as often. Um, the office-based procedures work really well for urgency, frequency, nocturnal overactive bladder. There are several options. There's Botox. Botox is something that we use to inject into the bladder. It's a very short procedure, takes less than a few minutes to do. 
It's right here in the office. We do numb patients a little bit to help them um, with any discomfort. Most patients tolerate very well and it works uh, very well for most patients. It lasts about six to nine months. So it is something that needs to be repeated. It's not something that is just done once and it works forever. It does eventually wear off, but it is a, is, it is a very good treatment option for patients. We also do a procedure called urethral bulking. So if you leak with stress incontinence where you leak when you cough and sneeze, urethral bulking is something that can be done either in the office or in the hospital with sedation, um, where we use a gel type of material in the urethra which is where the urine comes out of, to help block it off a little bit, to help prevent that type of leakage. And the success rates are pretty high for that as well. Um, PTNS is another treatment. It's also called tibial nerve stimulation. It's similar to acupuncture. There's a small little um, needle, similar to an acupuncture needle that's placed at the level of the ankle. And it um, helps control the signals that your bladder is getting um, to help decrease the urge and the frequency. So PTNS is a treatment that we do in our office. It's, it's for most patients, completely painless. Um, it's a short procedure and that does help with the uh, control as well. We also have surgical options, um, which you may have heard of, um, you know, from, from other physicians. If you, if you bring up your incontinence, they may talk about some surgical options available to you. So slings are a common procedure that we use for stress incontinence, for leakage with coughing and sneezing. For most women who get a sling, their success rates are quite high, and um, they, it's, it's considered you know, something that, that will cure the stress incontinence. So uh, the likelihood of still having any kind of stress incontinence after having something like a sling is very low. It's, a, it's a, about a 30 minute uh, simple outpatient procedure with minimal recovery time and patients do very well. There are other ways to suspend um, urethra with uh, sutures or stitches. There's also a procedure called sacral neuromodulation. Now sacral neuromodulation is a wonderful procedure that does help with the overactive bladder or the getting to the bathroom in time, waking up at night, going frequently. Sacral neuromodulation is a simple outpa outpatient procedure as well. It, um, it's basically sort of like a bladder pacemaker that's controlling the nerves of the bladder. It lasts for about 15 to 20 years. Um, so it's not something that needs to be redone um, yearly or, or often. And it makes a huge difference for most patients. There's a test that we do for it first to make sure you're a good candidate for it and to make sure it actually helps you. Um, but the key takeaway, I think, is that there's many options. So if you're suffering with incontinence, it's not something that you have to live with. It, it really is something that's treatable and in most cases curable, where you can come in, we will get your medical history, we'll do an exam, we'll figure out the best options for you, and um, together we'll come up with the plan that's best for you so that we can help you and achieve your goals, whatever those goals may be. Um, we haven't talked yet about prolapse, but when we do, we'll talk about some of the options for that too, which are sometimes surgical and sometimes non-surgical. So that, again, if you're suffering from incontinence, you are definitely not alone. One in four women over the age of 18 do suffer from incontinence. So it's a common procedure, um, I'm sorry, a common uh, condition. It gets worse with age. So if you do have it, it's not going away. It most likely will just get worse with time as you get older. And there's typically not much benefit to waiting till it gets really bad to come in and fix it. So while we may not talk about it that much amongst our friends, or if you go to the doctor, it may not come up. It might not be a question that they ask you about, but if you're suffering from um, any type of urinary incontinence, just know that it's common and you don't have to deal with it. And just because you don't really hear anybody else talking about it, it doesn't mean that you're the only one that has that problem. It's so common. And I think, it, you know, as the years go on, if we talk about it more, I think uh, patients will be more, um, willing or open to, to the, some of the treatment options that are out there, but feel free to talk to your primary care about it, your OBGYN. If you wanted to come in directly to see us, you can always do that too, but just know that there's treatment options out there. It's not something you have to live with and you're not the only one that has it. It's so common um, and it's also quite treatable. Most women are suffering for years before they seek help. Um, help. So about 33% of women wait somewhere between one years to five years to, to ask their doctors about it or to look for some sort of help. 26% um, of women wait more than five years. So the majority of women are waiting, you know, a long period of time before they're actually even bringing it up. So um, I hope that a, a, a seminar like this will help bring some education out to the population so that we know that 
we don't have to suffer with this. We don't have to just live with this. There are treatments out there and it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to bring it up with your primary care or your OBGYN or even come to a urologist or your gynecologist directly to bring up the problem so that you can be helped. This is um, from voicesforpfd.org and I have that website on, it, on one of the upcoming slides. Um, this website is very helpful, I think, for patients because it comes from the American Urogynecologic Society, or AUGS, which is um, our medical society, and, and they have this website that's dedicated for patients with just information for you. So um, this is a life impact tracker for overactive bladder. So if you're suffering from the urge to go, going frequently, waking up at night, and um, you know, kind of want to gauge how much it really is bothering you, it's a nice little tracker where you can keep track of, you know, is it making you feel anxious, depressed, embarrassed, angry? Um, how often is this happening? Is it affecting your intimacy? And um, it's just, a, and I think a nice little tool to just kind of help um, figure out, well, how much is it really bothering me? And, and it, it might be bothering you more than you think. Um, the other condition I wanted to talk about today is pelvic organ prolapse. So the majority of what I do as a urogynecologist is helping women who are suffering from urinary incontinence, but also women who are suffering from pelvic organ prolapse. So prolapse is quite common. It happens to many women and it tends to get worse as you get older. Um, some of the risk factors for prolapse are pregnancy and childbirth, just aging, going through menopause, certain health conditions such as obesity, chronic cough, constipation, um, women who do heavy lifting. There are tons of um, risk factors for pelvic organ prolapse. So genetics isn't the only reason. Um, if your mom didn't have this, but you have it, you know, there's so many reasons why that could have happened. Or just because you have it doesn't mean necessarily your daughter will have it because it's not just genetics. So what is prolapse? Prolapse is when those pelvic floor muscles, which we had talked about earlier, um, start to weaken. And as they weaken, the floor of the, the vagina actually starts to fall. So when the vagina loses its support, the nearby organs can come down as well. So if the top or front wall of the vagina starts to fall, the bladder can come down with it. If the bottom wall of the vagina um, loses its support, the rectum can actually start bulging into the vagina and that creates um, a prolapse. The uterus itself can lose its support and the ligaments are just not as strong as they used to be. And over time, the uterus can fall down. And for some women who have had a hysterectomy where they've had the uterus removed, they still have their vagina intact and the vagina itself can lose its support and fall. And when it does, things like your small intestines or bowels can come down too. So there's lots of different organs that can be affected by prolapse. For a patient, what you may notice is that you feel something some sort of bulge when you go to the bathroom to wipe, you might feel something that, sh that wasn't really there before. Or when you go to shower or clean, you might feel that there's something in the vaginal area that feels different or feels like it wasn't really there uh, previously. Some women describe it as sitting on a ball. So they feel like they're sitting on something. Um, it can feel like a pressure and heaviness in the vagina. It can feel like a tampon that's sort of either stuck or starting to fall out. So it feels like there's something different and something coming down. Generally, prolapse is not painful. So most women who have prolapse don't feel pain. They feel more of like a bulge sensation or something coming down. Um, and again, there's so many different reasons why it can happen. Um, the important thing is to come in to have it evaluated, whether that's with starting with your gynecologist, your primary care doctor, or coming in to see a specialist, like a urogynecologist or a urologist who deals with prolapse. Um, we will let you know which organ is prolapsed, and usually it's a combination uh, where it might be both the bladder and the rectum. So the terms that you may hear are cystocele, which is where there's vaginal prolapse that's bringing down the bladder. A rectocele is where there's vaginal prolapse that uh, brings down the rectum. And then uterine prolapse where the uterus comes down or vaginal vault prolapse, which is where you've had a hysterectomy and the vagina itself is, is falling down. So this, um, this sheet that we're looking at on the slide is again from that same website, voicesforpfd.org. Um, and again, it's a really good website for patients to just do their own research to um, learn a bit, little bit more about these conditions. But you can see there's pictures uh, showing you what each of those conditions are. And it just talks about um, what the condition is and, and how to treat it. 
So from a treatment standpoint, what can you do about it? Generally, we tell patients there's about, there's approximately three different choices. One would be conservative treatments or, or sort of living with the prolapse and not necessarily intervening in any way, but doing things observation, watch and see. If it's not that bad, it's not really bothering you. Do you really need to treat it? Not necessarily. It really depends on how much it's bothering you. Some women opt to do pelvic floor physical therapy to try to strengthen their pelvic muscles. Um, the other choice that some women make is an intervention called a pessary. So in these images, you can see what a pessary looks like. A pessary is a silicone device. It's either shaped like a ring. We have tons of different sizes and shapes. Um, and that's something that you get fitted for when you come into the office. So if you're looking for a pessary, a pessary is a supportive device um, and it's placed in the vagina to help push the vaginal walls up and lift those organs that are falling. So a pessary can be left in place um, depending on which type for sometimes three to four months without needing to be removed. Um, there are pessaries that patients themselves can remove, clean and replace as needed. And um, so that's an option. And then the third option would be surgery. So there are surgical options as well. And if you can see the list of options on this page, there are uh, vaginal surgeries, there's abdominal surgeries, there's robotic surgeries. So there's lots of different options. And the key is to come in to get evaluated so we can figure out what the best option is for you. Most of the surgeries that we do are typically either outpatient or overnight stays with a you know, minimal recovery. In general, uh, I would say it's sort of similar to childbirth in that there's no heavy lifting, no intercourse, no swimming and things like that for usually about four to six weeks. Um, but patients are up and walking right away. So when they have surgery, they're walking around immediately that night. There's no reason to be in bed rest. From a pain standpoint, most, pa most patients do quite well um, and usually take just over the counter pain medications. Occasionally they might need something stronger. Uh, but from a surgical standpoint, most patients do quite well, and um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple recovery for most patients. So whether you choose to do exercises, to do phys physical therapy, to wear a pessary, or even have surgery, there are options for you. If you're having a prolapse, it's a good idea to get it checked, so that way you know what exactly is prolapse, which organ, what stage, how bad is it, and, and what are your options. These are some resources that I think are really helpful for, for patients. So AGS.org is the American Urogynecologic Society with a lot of information and fact sheets for patients. Most of the um, information that I've given you today is from this specific website, voicesforpfd.org. Um, there's an online community that's been developed by the Urogynecologic Society to help educate patients and caregivers about the pelvic floor disorders. Um, and there's opportunity for um, involvement with an online community. There's videos, there's apps, there's printable resources. So I think it's a very good uh, site if you're looking for more information. Um, there's also another site called yourpelvicfloor.org, and that's from the from IUGA or the International Urogynecologic Association. And um, this site is nice because they also have fact sheets for patients in different languages. Um, so I think these are some really good resources if you're looking to do a little bit more online research to understand a little bit more about these conditions.